comadres. Welcome to the ninth episode of Comadreando. I'm your host, Marcy. And much like the Cars, Cranes, and Trains episode, I am flying solo today. When I was thinking about what topic I should cover alone, um, the topic of the future came up. Not like, let me look into my crystal ball and predict the future, but it's something that's been on my mind constantly since my son first got diagnosed when he was 18 months a toddler and it worries me now more than ever because in September Aiden's gonna be starting high school it's also a topic that people keep bringing up so you know people are always like oh what are your plans is Aiden gonna go to college are you gonna have more children are you gonna live with him you know all these questions are good questions and it's something that worries me not so much because and that I fear anything bad is gonna happen it's more so that you know it's unknown and it gives me anxiety too because I don't know what's gonna happen really and um you know thinking about it it just gives me nervous but for now you know I'm taking it one day at a time and you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to be present and in the moment and enjoy the things while they're happening because, you know, he grew up. For me, it felt like all of a sudden it was, you know, he's 13 now and I have little videos in my phone from when he was like one year old or, you know, an infant. And, you know, it, the time goes by so quickly and I worrying about the future is not something that I try to do, you know. But before we go into the future go back to the past we're going to talk about the beginning when Aiden first got diagnosed actually you know what let's go further back than that let's turn back the DeLorean um back to when I was pregnant with my son and I first got that news that uh the pregnancy test came back positive and that I would be having a child I know it's happened to other parents and a lot of my comadres and compadres out there, even for people that don't have children, you have this como una ilusión. It's a, an illusion, not an illusion, a dream of what your children will be like. And, you know, you have these expectations that you have for their future. You haven't even had them. You're thinking about, you know, what kind of personality they'll have, what kind of people they'll be in society. You think about the career choices they will make, what they're going to look like, whether they're going to get married and have a family, if they're going to, you know, first job, their career choice, all these things you think about. And you create this, I want to call it like a piece of art. It's a piece of art because it's a dream. You know, you fashion it of your best intentions for your child and you carry this with you the whole time and unintentionally as you're raising them you're like pushing them towards that that dream or that goal and you know once we got all the evaluations done and you know i'm in the office i'm with aiden he was actually having a hard time that day. He was so uncomfortable. He ended up falling asleep in my lap, which he never does. And I just, you know, I'm there like I have him on my chest and I'm rocking him. And they're finally, you know, reading me all the reports. And then they finally give me the diagnosis that Aiden has PDD. PDD is Pervasive Developmental Disorder, NOS, which is not otherwise specified. So it's not Pervasive Developmental Disorder with any other concurrences. It's just kind of like he has a developmental delay. We don't know what it is yet. So this is the diagnosis that we're giving him. And I feel like in that moment, that that beautiful piece of art or, you know, that a future, fragile future, was taken away from me and smashed to the ground. And I started to cry, um, like hysterically. 
um, I couldn't stop myself. And it, it was one of those cries. I don't know if my l- listeners or, if, you know, the people on the, that listen to the podcast, if they've ever experienced something like that. But I, I remember crying like this when I was a kid, like being so hurt and crying so hard that I could not catch my breath. So it's kind of like you're like crying and you're like, <laughs> like, you know, like breathing in and crying and, and, and just kind of like really letting it all out. And I feel like I cried not because I was sad, but it was more because the fear of the unknown, you know, you had this expectation and then all of a sudden this is not an option anymore. Or at least that version of the option is not an option anymore. So it was just a really hard time. And and I actually went through the stages of grief. You know, first it was denial, right? You know, when I first started noticing the delays in Aiden, I was just like, yeah, I'm just going to get him evaluated. They're probably not going to say he has anything. It's just, you know, he's going to need speech or something. Then I went through isolation, you know. I didn't have anybody in the family that had a disability or any baby cousins or anything like that. So I felt very alone. And even with my family, my family is very supportive, but we had never had anybody like my, I mean, I'm talking about my, what is it called? Nuclear family, right? Like my brothers, my mom and I, you know, we've never really had experienced anybody like working with anybody or or um you know somebody in the family with a a developmental delay right so I felt alone then I went through the stage of anger I was very angry I was very like why me why my child you know it was not a good like not that it wasn't good I'm not judging myself it's it's more like you know, I was just really upset, really upset. Um, then the bargaining, right? Bargaining was more like trying to find where or what was the reason why Aiden all of a sudden developed, well, according to me, all of a sudden developed autism when he was hitting all the milestones, you know? Um, you know, I wanted to know if it was something that I did. You know, I was blaming myself. And then I was like trying to see if, you know, if my ex-husband's family had people in his family that might have had autism. Just like some kind of explanation to try to wrap my head around the fact that, you know, my child now has a disability, which I had no idea about before. And that his future or his childhood was going to look very different from, you know, what I experienced and what other people have experienced not that everybody has similar experiences or anything like that it was just more so you know just trying to wrap my head around it and then you know after that it was over um depression and I'm gonna be honest like I was already you know suffering on and off from postpartum um I don't know how long that actually lasts but uh it contributed more to feeling you know lonely and sad and you know, being in this headspace that, I don't know, like, it was just, I couldn't get myself motivated, even though I had this child, you know, who needed me, I couldn't get myself out of that, like, snap myself out of that depression, um, and then, you know, uh, what really helped me during that stage was, you know, my family, my family, you know, they're like, oh, you know, you know, it's, it's not that bad, you know, at least he's independent somewhat and can speak even though he's not speaking how he used to speak and he can, you know, he's ambulatory, he can walk, you know, there's, and then this is, sometimes people try to make you feel better, but it's kind of like using other people's situations to make you kind of see the brighter side. So, you know, like at least it's not this or that or whatever the case may be. And then at the end, it's acceptance. You know, there's a shift in mindset and you stop 
looking at your child in a deficits based perspective and more of a what can my kid do you know and looking at those things as positives yeah it was a lot um i don't i don't i think that the uh, the diagnosis of autism because they're the evaluations are being done by professionals that are not psychiatrists you can only not psychiatrists um developmental psychologists you can only really get a diagnosis of autism if you do a full um neuropsychological evaluation so um a neuropsychologist would go in and evaluate your kid and give them the diagnosis of autism and then when they're that small it's hard to do those that test so i'm guessing that in the dsm-5 i'm sure there's like some kind of and then i'm sorry i'm gonna do a sidebar dsm-5 is the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders so it's basically like the like a reference uh, text for psychologists and psychiatrists regarding disabilities and mental disorders. Um, so yeah, I don't know if in the DSM five there's some kind of age requirement to be able to diagnose something somebody with autism, but I know that the symptoms of autism, the onset is eighteen months to two years for boys and for girls it's a little bit um later on in their development but yeah um it, it was it was a whole learning experience in leaving behind those expectations and learning my child and learning how he learns you know and you know in that moment i felt hopeless and defeated and like I had failed him as a mother um, but you know once I, I shifted my mindset from that deficit space to you know what can my kid do it, it's like it changed it shone, it shone it shined it shined a light on him you know yes he doesn't do things how everybody does them and he might not think the way that we think and that's okay you know he has his own little special way of doing things um a non of mine from my dad's side actually you know she had just got into annoyed and because um i'm not really close to that side of the family but she had um she was getting to know him and you know we were visiting in dominican republic and I, um, while I'm there, she's telling me that I'm really blessed. And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, Aiden is such a special child. And I know it's hard. And you're going through things that I can't understand. But God wouldn't have given him to you if he didn't feel like you were going to give this child everything that he needs to be successful. Sorry, guys. I'm like getting teary-eyed but um everything he needs to be successful and to nurture him and love him the way that he needs to be loved so you know i took that to heart and um yeah like i've been going through it you know it's it hasn't been easy it's been hard some things that i talk about like even like Things as simple as, I think I touched on this in the IEP episode with, with Mo. Um, things as simple as eating. He wasn't able to chew and swallow before. He wasn't able to chew even though he had teeth. So when he first got diagnosed in early intervention, that he got the um, IFSP, he had speech and feeding. So they had to teach him how to chew and, and do all these massages and give him a chewy tube to learn how to eat. And now he, I have to stop him because <laughs> he eats so much and he eats independently. You know, he can feed himself. Another thing that we had, we struggled with was a lot of behavior issues when he was small. I feel like, and this is not just kids with special needs. I feel like chill toddlers, especially try to manipulate you and, 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 you know, but like for kids, where for at least where Aiden 
it was extreme. So he would tantrum, but it wouldn't be a regular tantrum. It was like he would throw himself on the floor and it didn't matter where we were at. I forgot what it was. We were walking somewhere and he wanted to stop for something. I can't remember for the life of me what it could have been. But I was with his ABA therapist who... ABA is Applied Behavior Analysis. It's a, ch a therapy that they use for children with developmental disorders to help them learn behaviors that are more appropriate, socially appropriate than what they're using to cope. So that was one of the goals, like having him follow directions and not tantrums. So Mr. Aiden used to throw himself on the floor in the middle of the street and cry. Um, to the point that I would have to stop what I was doing, you know, and handle the situation. So his ABA therapist at the time, Isabel, she told me, Marcia, he knows that if he cries, you're going to stop and he's going to get his way and you're going to give in. So I need you to keep walking. And I'm looking at her like she's crazy. You know, I'm just like, how am I going to leave my toddler in the middle of the street? She's like, just go out. We'll be back here. Just keep walking. So Aiden's on the floor crying, kicking his feet, pulling his hair, um, boogers, tears, everything on the floor. And I'm walking. As I'm walking, I'm emotional. You know, I'm like slightly crying. And I, I keep looking back and he's still crying and still on the floor. And it comes a point that I was like, I want to say like, 20 steps away and Mr. Aiden gets up wipes his little tears and starts running after me so you know after that like I I know I know I knew that even though he wasn't communicating with me how I needed to he understood a lot of things and just because he had a disability doesn't mean that he he doesn't comprehend certain things. So yeah, after that, the, no more tantrums. Well, not no more tantrums, but I knew what to do. Um, I had a plan of action. Um, what else was it? Oh, okay. Um, another thing that was really bad and, and then got better was going to the barber shop. He would when he first when he first got a haircut, which was when he turned one there was no issue because he he was basically a baby he still the onset of autism hadn't happened yet and um it was fine but once his dad and i separated he was about a year and a couple of months i had to take him to the barber shop by myself and that's when i started noticing like you know the aversion to being there um barbershops are overstimulating in general especially here in the heights you know everybody's loud telling stories drinking sometimes um depending on the time of day you go smoking hookah there's loud music you know it, it's a lot of things that if you think about it from their perspective is overwhelming and can be too much sensory input for them so you know that i had to start um i start i got in contact with his barber and he started coming to the house to cut his hair and that went on for about six months then finally the barber was like there was a day he couldn't come and he was like bring him to the shop I'll make sure that it's okay so you know I went in the morning it was pretty quiet and you know I had to sit with him and put him between my legs and the guy's cutting his hair I'm stressed out because there's other people there and they're looking at me and him you know, I'm stressed out and I don't know, but I guess when I get stressed out, I start sweating. And it's not like a little gliss and it's not like I'm glowy. No, it's like sweat. And Aiden's crying and I'm like anxious and then I'm sweating and I'm holding him. You know, I'm like, you know, holding like holding him so he won't run away. And like the guy's trying to cut his hair as fast as possible. And by the time I left the barbershop, I was full of hair. He was full of hair. Um, it was just not a pretty sight. And then fast forward to now, the other day I, I, I was commenting to 
online that he was able to go to the shop and he didn't need his phone. He was able to sit and wait for the barber and, you know, wait his turn, get in the chair, not use a device, watch while the barber was like cutting his hair, you know, say thank you. And like actually like take turns in the conversation. Like the barber would ask him how he was doing and he responded. And then he said something else to the barber and it, it you know, we're still working on that conversation piece because he doesn't initiate conversations independently. He'll respond if you ask him a question, but for it to come from him to like socialize with you, we're still working on that. So, you know, going from, you know, me holding him down for him to get a haircut to being able to be independent without a phone or a device to cut his hair is like night and day. And, and I, I, I look at those situations like, you know, I, I still see that he has a lot to work on to get as close to his typically developing peers as possible. But I do see the the how he has grown in leaps and bounds. And I really am so fortunate to have had the people that we have had um, in his life that have worked with him, the teachers and and the occupational therapists and the and the physical therapists and the speech people you know it it's it's been really amazing like everything that he's been going through and and how he has gotten better um what else well you can go to the supermarket now and he basically tells you enter the restaurants and he'll tell you exactly what he wants that's one thing aiden definitely is very decided and he knows what he likes so he'll go to the supermarket and you ask for all the things that he likes um if i say no he's okay with that now before not so much um he goes to the restaurants and he knows exactly what he wants to order you know it, it, it's been a work in progress it does does get better so for me the plans for high school for aiden you know i'm seeing how he's how it's going he's way better than he has ever been um and I intend for him to go to the high school that's linked to the school that he's at right now. The school's phenomenal. It's actually District 75. And he got placed right before he went to junior high school. He got placed in a 12 to 1 to 1 classroom, which is 12 students, one adult, and one assistant teacher. And he's been doing so great. And his little personality is shining. Um, with respect to college... You know, I don't know if the traditional college experience is for him yet. But we'll, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Um, I want to say that if, in my heart of hearts, I wish he can go to some kind of media program where he can embrace his little gifts and, and the talents that he has. I've spoken before on the show about his little superpower, which is audio editing. He's so good at creating content. Um, I actually have been thinking about opening a YouTube for him where he puts on his videos. So what he's into right now is taking audio from one show and finding appropriate video from another show and essentially dubbing the episode with the audio from the other show so basically like he watches this on youtube all the time so he'll watch he'll watch yo gabba gabba with the audio from backyard against or something like that or you know sesame street audio with something else so he he that's his creative thing he loves to do that and he basically taught himself so i'm i see a future with him in audio engineering you know you know, if I could, if I would essentially be able to send him to a school that he can learn this a vocational school or something, I would love that for him. Another career that I've thought about for him in college is voice acting. He is really like he is phenomenal. 
at remembering stories and retelling them using voices and changing the voices for other characters he's very animated and um he'll he has an amazing memory he will remember the text to repeat or the 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 script and like basically repeat it verbatim he i spoke on this on um the left hand perspectives podcast he will he there he has favorite stories that he knows from the f first page to the very last page and he'll tell them to you verbatim so some of the stories that he loves is um one of them is click clack moo by uh, by um Okay, I'll put the, the link to the story in, in the show notes. Um, click like Moo, he loves. He loves Dr. Seuss books, even though Dr. Seuss is not controversial. But his favorite um, book is The Cat in the Hat, and he knows that front to back. Uh, what else? Those, those are like the top two that he knows. And he is so good at reading with, with expression. He's hyperlexic, so he can read way past his um, grade level. Um, comprehension's not all the way there just yet. But yeah, like those are the things that, those are the careers that I've thought about for him. Um, he's also really good with animals, so maybe a veterinarian, we don't know. But I'm not, I say that to say this, uh, I am not placing my expectations on my child. I'm letting him be him and, and accepting him for who he is. Um, uh, another question that people ask me is that, what are my plans for the future once Aiden becomes an adult? In a perfect scenario, you know, Aiden will be independent and will be living on his own with his own family eventually. And if that happens, you know, I am okay. And if it doesn't happen, I'm okay as well. But for now, if, you know, if he if he's still the way he is now, I foresee me maybe buying a mother-daughter house in the future and moving in, both of us living in the same house, even though he'll have his own space and his own apartment living together. Uh, if he's able to be independent um, or if he's not he can you know live with me but like I, I essentially want him to live with me just I want him to be able to have his own space so he doesn't feel like I'm intruding or you know not having boundaries with him because he is growing you know he's 13 right now I don't know if I've mentioned this before but developmentally it is 13 chronologically Developmentally, however, he has a 33% delay, which if we calculate that, that will land him at about nine years old. So it makes sense by the way he functions and, um, you know, the things that he does, even though his body is developing and he's prepubescent or, or actually going through puberty right now, um, developmentally he's not there so you know I, I think about the future kind of like that like you know he's 21 quote unquote but how old will he be developmentally and you know I'll go by that so yeah the, the plans are you know if he goes away to college I'm gonna be traveling investing in property having fun <laughs> kind of living on my 20s as an older person <laughs> Well, not as crazy as 20, but, you know, I just, it, there was a tweet that I wanted to share with all of you. And, and the gist of the tweet was that your kids are not your property and that putting these expectations on them actually does more harm than good. Because if they don't live up to those expectations, it can have effects on them in the long run. And I feel like I'm in total agreement with that. Another question people ask me is, is 
since he's already 13, he's going to be a teenager. Well, he is a teenager. Um, will I have more kids? And the answer to that is I don't know. If I find someone that I end up with, a partner that doesn't have children, for me, it's like starting over again. You know, I have a child that's completely, in the, well, you know, very independent. All I have to do is give him verbal reminders and then I would go back to changing diapers and going through motherhood again. Um, and I love children. You know, that's why I'm a teacher, but I like giving them back as well. So I don't know. That, the answer to that is I don't know. Uh, of course, I've dreamed about having a little girl with my curls, a carbon copy of me running around, doing the most, being sassy. Um but I, I, I'm still working through certain traumas that I have from when Aiden first got diagnosed, not necessarily with him, but things that I read. You know, I read a lot of research that said that the propensity or the likelihood of parents with kids with special needs, especially with autism, to have a second child with the same disability is very high. And, you know, I want to be responsible not that it's irresponsible to have children after you have a child with special needs, but I don't know. It, it's it's something that I'm. sometimes I feel like yes, and sometimes I feel like no. Also, you know, my window for that is closing, I think. You know, I'm 38 years old. <laughs> I want to be one of these moms pushing a stroller, and I have a head full of white hair. Um <laughs> But yeah, like the answer to that is I don't know. But you know, my plans are not that traveling, like you can be inhibited to travel if you have a baby, but you know, I just think about like that time when I was pregnant, like I was reading all those books, um, what to expect when you're expect expecting. And it's actually, it was pretty nightmarish for me because honestly, like I know it's the reality, all these things can happen, but I would open up a chapter and it's like, oh, hey, your baby's the size of a cantaloupe, but also all these things can go wrong. And it was scary. It was re To me, it was scary. I don't know if other people feel like that out there. Definitely send me a comadogram to let me know what you felt, how you felt about reading that book when you were pregnant or, you know, if you're the partner, if you're, uh, while your significant other was pregnant uh it, it was not a good look but yeah no i don't i don't really know if the genetics for autism are coming from my side of the family or his dad's side of the family you know granted i wouldn't be having a child with the same person but it's a gamble and i'm not a gambling person so that is the answer to that for now I might change my mind who knows you know um, and then people ask me career-wise what do I want to do um, yes I teach right now but after the pandemic it has taken me a lot to process everything especially how teachers were treated at the beginning like everybody's like oh my god heroes yes teachers oh my god we can't believe you do this and then towards the end that, you know, they're trying to reopen everything back up and bring us back in the classrooms. Basically, you know, uh, parents are like, you know, these teachers, they're just getting paid right now to just be in their house and, you know, whatever. Mind you, we're teaching the kids. It's not, it's just because we're not in the building doesn't mean we're not working. Um, you know, we were doing it remotely. So, you know, like, the pandemic has put everything into perspective and made me prioritize things that are of importance. And I do love teaching, but I like my mental health more. And, you know, I want to be able, like, I love my job, but I feel like I could be doing more and affecting greater change in the community in a different way. What way is that? I don't know. Um, I don't have all the answers right now. I'm not perfect. I'm human. Um, obviously, I wouldn't leave 
the Department of Education before before I have another uh, career secured. But right now I'm studying programming and looking at computer science and things like that, things that I'm interested in to see how I can, you know, what is it, hone the sword, just like improve my skills and give myself workable skills in other career fields. I remember when, and I spoke about this before, I remember when I was working corporate, I was very unhappy. I was burnt out. I had been working four years already in, in um, corporate banking, not corporate banking, but retail banking. And I used to wake up and I hated my job. I loved working with the customers. The customers were great. Like, you know, dealing with people is not easy, but the variety and the newness, like every day was different. It wasn't like monotonous and you're just sitting there in front of a desk shoveling papers, which I have done before. You know, it was very different, but it got to a point I, I couldn't drink the Kool-Aid anymore. And um, that that's when I decided to change careers and, and become a teacher. And now almost 40 and I'm thinking about doing other things or how I can use this education that I have and the things that I know and that I've learned to better help my community. I was thinking about affecting change, like in po educational policies or just basically trying to see how we can change the system of education which, by the way, public education was implemented in the 1800s, and it's the same model still. And I feel like that doesn't work anymore because we're not, the jobs are different, where people are not going to school to become factory workers. People are not going to school to become blue-collar workers. It's we're, we're supposed to be preparing children for these jobs that don't exist right now. If you would have told me that somebody was going to have a job working at Meta doing programming when I was six years old, I would have been like, what is that? What do you mean? So there's a lot of jobs that exist now that did not exist 30 something years ago. And going into the future when our children are older, there are jobs that are not going to that are going to exist that didn't exist now. So it is our responsibility to prepare these children for these jobs. And in order to prepare them for the jobs, we need to nurture creativity. We need to nurture, you know, exploration. We need to nurture questioning, which the system of education right now, the way that it's set up, it's not for people to think independently. So, you know, affecting change in that way and, and helping revamp this, the entire system of education because it's not serving our children correctly, if I'm completely honest, you know, unless you have a parent that is like really on it and, and helping their children and really present, you know, there's, there's things that don't, there's some skills or things that are lacking in the education of your child plus remember the teacher can do so much we have other children in the classroom and it's not just your kid so definitely you know i was looking at the proposal from the new mayor and he was proposing you know longer school days uh having saturday classes a longer school year and i'm all for that but that would work when we shift the change um, with respect to the field of education and give teachers the respect that they deserve as professionals and um, you know, change everything from the ground up. It can't just be like certain, certain changes here and there. Like I, I can see how in the long run it can, it can have better results, but definitely re-looking at the system of education in the country. And with that, I wanted to touch on 
a couple of comadre grams that I received. The first one is from my friend Franny. Shout out to Franny. She is an avid listener. And I asked her regarding the topic, like how she felt about it, about the future, what what worried her or what were her things that she wanted to talk about. And um, she said, I think when they are in this adolescence age, there is this safety of knowing you're the guardian and supplier of all their needs. I think one thing I think about when it comes to the future is independence, which we're in agreement about, right? Are we considering, she's saying her and her husband, are we are we considering, we are, we're considering purchasing a larger home in case our boys need to stay with us long term. What if they're always going to need us? Question mark. I'm mentally prepared to do it, but hopeful that there's a place for them in this world. And I feel like part of my work that I'm doing now is helping to create that inclusive environment for these children. You know, I want to say, well, you know what, let me get to the other comadregram and then I'll touch on what I was going to say right now. And then another comadregram that I got from Yadi. Shout out to Yadi, who's also an avid listener. She has questions, which is like, what happens after high school? You know, transitioning to the adult world. Uh, you know, what, what happens? I feel like that's something I would most likely bring an expert about that, uh, maybe a counselor that works with children with special needs to see what it is that happens because right now I'm not I'm, I'm I, I don't even know what happens after high school you know uh, she also is worried about the transition to independence and being out in the community like how will they be received another question she has is how to deal with law enforcement and um, just a heads up comadres I'm actually gonna interview a friend of mine that's a police officer and kind of pick his brain about procedure and maybe we can get tips from him on how to keep our children safe because I know I touched on this on one a couple of episodes ago it's like how do they deal with people that have special needs if there's some kind of if they're if the police are called on them and and how do they respond so those are all such great questions. So the topic, the thing that I was going to end with, sort of, this is the last thing that we're going to talk about before we end the episode, is creating inclusive environments starts with us. So for me, I'm very, I love children with special needs, and I feel like, you know, I'm very tolerant of them. Not tolerant. I love them. Like, I accept them for who they are. Little quirks and all, everything. Like, absolutely, this is why I chose the field that I chose. I felt I had to analyze myself because these children grow up and they become adults. And these adults don't have to disclose their disabilities with you. So being very cognizant of that as you operate, you know, when you interact with other people, because it's so easy to judge and have these expectations of behavior for other adults based on, you know, what you think people should behave like or what they should say and how they should be. But these kids, they become adults. And I had to check myself. I honestly had to sit down and check myself because there was a person at a when I used to work corporate that was a little awkward and it was a customer. They would come in and they only wanted to see me every single time. And, you know, I would be with other customers and they would wait. I would have a wait list and, and he the, he would wait until... I was available because he did not feel comfortable sitting with other people, you know, and I would get annoyed. I'm like, you know what? You know, I've been working back to back with customers the whole time. I was a banker at the time. So, you know, I'm exhausted. And, and, and then this person is like coming in and then it was kind of like, you know, they're already antsy and edgy and, and dealing with other people. 
and they come to me and they're, you know, unloading on me. And then I had to sit with that and I'm like, why is it that it's bothering me? And then I started thinking, I was like, after I became a teacher, I'm like, wow, this person might have had a, a disability, you know, and I'm, you know, my gut reaction was like kind of like annoyance and being upset, but, you know, to be able to create those inclusive environments, we also need to think about those adults with special needs. And after, after like, I thought about that, because Aiden is getting older, you know, I, I try to prepare my students for the future and, you know, they, they're going to be adults and we have to be, have them be ready to interact with society, but also be tolerant of people that are not quote unquote, don't fit the mold or are, you know, march to the beat of their own drum. They don't follow the society's quote unquote norms for behavior or, you know, responses and things like that. I actually worked with somebody that had Asperger's. She didn't tell me she did, but you know, now I have the, they call it queer eye, right? For other men who, not men, but people that are queer, they can recognize other people that are, right? I have I've, I have the special education eye now because I've been working eight plus years with people with special needs, young and old. And, you know, the person, the teacher never disclosed to me that she had Asperger's. But based on behaviors and, you know, the awkward social interactions and she would try to, to make conversation and, you know, I would find myself being a little, you know, annoyed because, like, she would pick moments when I'm, like, you know, I have a lot of things to do. But, um, you know, once, once like, I thought about it and I was like, oh, you know, it, it helped me interact with her in a more, you know, open way and and understand where she was coming from because she would get a lot of anxiety when things would change and and things would be thrown on her plate last minute so you know it helped me work with her in a better way and it created a better team at the end you know when you think about it that way um unfortunately the the administration we had in the building was not so tolerant of her and actually picked on her which is another topic for another day but um yeah to the point that she actually had to leave the school where she was at um, because she didn't feel supported by administration but it starts with you um as parents of children with special needs as family members of children with special needs as people that interact with people with special needs on a daily basis whether you know it or not we need to be have kindness at the forefront and operate from a space of love and forgiveness and acceptance more than anything. And with that, comadres, I hope that, you know, I have been able to help some parents that had some reservations about their children's development. And thank you for reaching out. I really appreciate it. And for the people that listen and the other people that know that this is my area of expertise, thank you for the referrals as well. Like, I love helping people. And if I can provide at least one resource or teach somebody one thing, I feel like I've, I've done my job. I want to close the episode saying what I always say, which is follow me at Comadre on the pod on Instagram. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to send me a comadregram via email at comadrando at esctheNetwork.com or DM me. Remember, I am here. I am your comadre. I can provide resources. I can be a listening ear. I am here. I know I didn't have this when my son was small, but this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to create a community. I want to say, oh, I want to give a shout out to the New York City Special Education Parents Group that I'm part of on WhatsApp. You ladies are amazing. Yadi's also part of that group. Um, I'm actually going to see if I can 
have them on for an episode, which would be amazing. Um, but yeah, so you guys know how to reach me and have a great evening. Thank you for spending time with your comadre. I will see you guys soon. Bye.